Awesome. Uh, let's get started. So, hi everyone. I hope you can hear me. I hope everyone has their headphones on. Uh, thanks so much for coming today. Uh, my name is Scott Sandre. Uh, I'm a senior software engineer at Databricks. I work on the Delta ecosystem team. And today I'm here to talk to you about the Delta Lake community, why it's thriving, and how you can contribute. I think now is a really exciting time to work on Delta, and I'm really glad that uh, everyone's come to this talk today. So just a little bit about me before I get started. Uh, I've been at Databricks over three years, and I work on everything Delta and everything open source Delta. So some of like my accomplishments or projects I've worked on, just to give you a bit of perspective, um, is I worked on Delta Uniform last year. We had a couple rushed months to develop that before Data AI Summit, and that was launched in Delta 3.0 last year, which is super exciting. And I think Uniform is only being made more important with like the recent um, acquisition um, of Tabular. So that's like super exciting. I'm here to answer any questions you have about that. I also work on Delta Kernel. There's lots of talks at DICE this year about Delta Kernel. It's kind of like the future of connector integrations with Delta. Um, so I also contribute, contribute to that. I also work on Delta Flink to sync the source, SQL table APIs, and things like that. That's a bit about my experience. So you would have seen the slides uh, a little earlier. Uh, and, you know the, and you know that Delta Lake is the most adapted lake house format. We are super, super I'm happy about this. Uh, over four plus, it might have been nine plus, we need to get our numbers right, exabytes of data processed per day. Um, a manager told me that's every single cat video on YouTube times two, and it requires everyone on Earth watching those. Uh, that's a lot of data. And over a billion clusters per year spin up to write or read Delta. Uh, and as we saw, that's uh, twice the yearly growth uh, over last year. So Delta's actually just taking off. Uh, we couldn't be happier. You saw some of these numbers earlier, so I won't spend too much time on them. But 60% of the Fortune 500 companies have adopted Delta, and that number's only growing. Over 10,000 companies use this in production. And at Databricks, I'm fortunate enough to work with some companies and see and learn like how they actually integrate Delta into their production workloads. Um, that's really exciting. Over 80 new features have in been introduced into Delta in the last year. And, I and you can go and compare that to some other table formats, but I really think this shows you how much innovation is being put into Delta. Uh, and these are features across the entire Delta ecosystem, not just the Delta Spark implementation. And I'll be going over some of those uh, today. And Delta's open. We have over 500 contributors working on Delta um, from across a variety of organizations. And we just love that more and more people from the community are bringing their attention to Delta, filing bugs, getting excited about new, new features, and building them. So again, we saw this, this slide earlier in the keynote, uh, but I do want to like just bring a bit more attention to this to, to fight some misconceptions. So it's absolutely true that engineers at Databricks were the original creators of Delta Lake. Okay, and but that was just the Spark implementation. Delta is now across so many different languages and so many different engines that uh, different repositories that people from all over the world are working on. This is actually only about like a third of the people working on Delta. So Delta is completely open, and we want all sorts of people joining Delta, joining the community, using our product, and helping to make it better. So let's talk a bit about about our community. So we actually have over 11 repos. This is across Scala, Spark, Rust, Python. Our website's super important. Um, Delta sharing is super important. Um, lots of different places you can go and check out to learn more about Delta and start like writing code and contributing to it. There's been over 50 releases, uh, which is a pretty exciting number, a pretty exciting milestone, which just shows you how much innovation is going into Delta and how often we're releasing new exciting features. And now let's just talk a little bit more about the community. Over 9,000 GitHub stars, 500 contributors, over 350 organizations. <laughs> Databricks is just one of those. Uh, 10,000 people on our Slack. Our Slack is super active. We really encourage you to join our Slack, start asking some questions for troubleshooting, for dev, for your particular Delta connector. 50,000 people on LinkedIn, that's a great place to go and learn about Delta and see some of the latest blogs and see the conversation. And a few thousand still growing on our YouTube channel. So one thing I want to talk about today um, is how Delta's grown over the years. So we've actually just reached a milestone of over 20 million downloads per month, which is really, really exciting. There's been a lot of work to make this happen, a lot of releases, a lot of connector integrations. And an interesting thing I want to talk about here is 
which users are using the latest version of Delta. And it's actually not where we want it to be. It's unlike the, you know, unlike the iPhone where like 90% of people upgrade to the latest iOS each year. That's not what's going on with Delta. And that's a problem we are actively trying to address. And there's two reasons why that's the case. Um, the first is that connectors don't have the latest Delta protocol features. Delta Spark certainly does. That's the world's biggest implementation of the Delta protocol. But other connectors are trying to catch up. And so I encourage you to go to some Delta kernel talks today. Kernel is the future of Delta integrations. And by making kernel work, by making it really easy for connectors to plug into Delta, we're going to bring connectors to the latest version of Delta to get you like deletion of vectors automatically and things like that. Another problem is Spark upgrades. It's really hard to upgrade to the latest version of Spark, especially if Delta is always released against the latest version of Spark. And it can sometimes take like six months to make it to EMR. Spark Connect and Delta Connect, which were announced today at the keynote, solve those problems. So now like the server side, um, you can upgrade that completely independ independently of your application code. And this should really help users use the latest version of Delta Lake on Spark. And we're really excited about that. And I want to talk about like some community contributions, some great people that use Delta Lake, had some problems, and then contributed them to our code base uh, to improve like the Delta in their organization. Uh, just to show you like that Delta is open, and we want people coming and writing code and improving the Delta community. Like I love working with these with these users, uh, with these contributors. And I love solving these sorts of problems. This is one I actually worked on personally. So this is the age-old problem of S3 not supporting multi-cluster writes. What this means is it doesn't have mutual exclusion on writes. What this means is when two concurrent writers are trying to update the Delta protocol, the Delta log, they want to write the next Delta commit version, they both write at the same time. And S3 isn't able to actually say one's a winner and one's a loser. S3 actually allows both of them. What happens is they actually overwrite one another's commits. And this means one of those commits is gone. That's data loss. You're never getting that back. And this is a big problem. Before this solution, you could only have writes to the same delta table from within the same cluster, uh, which wasn't very flexible. So Samba TV had this problem, like many, many users in the delta uh, ecosystem. And they looked at our public docs, our public code, and our log store API. Our log store API defines like all of our cloud store interactions, like reading, writing, and listing. And they realized that there's room here for improvement. And what they did is they actually just plugged in DynamoDB um, as a locking mechanism and commit co coordinator. So now when you write to S3, you use DynamoDB, you write some very, very lightweight metadata, and we now coordinate concurrent writers, which means there is mutual exclusion and it is completely safe. And what's great about this is this works across clusters and across regions. So different regions around the globe can safely and concurrently write to the same Delta table in S3. This is super awesome. So they contributed this uh, two years ago and it has over 100,000 downloads per month, we've seen some really cool applications of this. So you can, for example, you can ingest with Delta Flink, and then you can go and optimize it and compact it with Databricks, with EMR and Delta Spark, anything you want. And this can all be happening concurrently while the ingestion is happening. Uh, without uh, this safe multi-cluster write solution, that wouldn't be possible. Another awesome community highlight is vacuum inventory support. Uh, and this was actually just added this year uh, in Delta 3.1. So let's talk about this a little bit. So vacuum is the operation of deleting parquet files that are no longer needed in your table. You can imagine you had some parquet files, then you've gone ahead and compacted them because you want to make bigger parquet files for more efficient reads. And those old parquet files are no longer needed. So you can and should go and clean up that data to save on your, your storage costs. So vacuum is like a multi-step operation, but it does require in one of those steps listing all the files in your table. We need to know what the active files are, the ones we want to keep, and all the files so we can know which ones we want to delete. And this can be slow on massive tables with lots of data files, especially if they're heavily partitioned. There can be a lot of list calls to your cloud store. So. GrabTaxi saw had this problem where their, their vacuums were taking six plus hours on giant tables. And they realized that all major cloud object stores provide a feature called inventory listing. It's like one way, place you can go to and ask, please give me all the files in my table. Uh, this is much cheaper than making thousands of recursive list calls. It's actually 44% cheaper for uh, you know, their tests that they ran. 
Uh, all this is completely public uh, blog data. You can go and read our blog and see all these stats. And this amounted to a 10 time faster vacuum operation because you don't go and do all those lists. You run inventory listing once on S3. It gives you some data, you save it to a file, you plug it into vacuum, and it makes things much cheaper and much faster. So this is just another great example of users of Delta having a problem, coming to Delta Lake, writing code, shipping it, and then you know, giving that solutions to thousands of other users as well. The last highlight I wanna talk about is uh, Uniform Hootie support. So we've heard a lot about Uniform. Um, I love that each year more and more people are learning about, like, about these very low level Delta keywords and technologies. But just to summarize, Uniform lets you have Parquet files and then translate Delta metadata into other table formats. It's basically free. There's very little write overhead because all you're doing is transferring and transforming the metadata, not the actual Parquet data. And last year, Delta 3.0, we announced um, Uniform su support for Iceberg. So you write Delta, translate Delta to Iceberg, and read as Iceberg anywhere. This is particularly useful, for example, to read it as Iceberg as an external table in Snowflake. That's a really interesting use case. So One House AI, they're the creators of Apache X table. Just in Delta 3.2 last month, they came and added Hootie support. So this is awesome, and even already, like with, with some customers and users of Delta, we're seeing some really cool use cases. We're seeing people that are writing Hootie today. They want to get to Delta, uh, like translate their data to Delta. They start writing Delta, but they want existing Hootie readers to, to still work and read Hootie. Well, you just turn on Uniform, translate the Hootie metadata, and now your existing readers can still do that. We've actually seen this applied even further, where people have um, Uniform enabled for all three formats. So you're writing Delta and translating it to Iceberg and Hootie, and you have all sorts of different readers reading one copy of the data. This is super exciting. So now you wanna start writing code. I'm glad everyone's here. I'm glad people wanna learn more about Delta. Um, we have a book that's completely free on our website. That's a really, really good read. We have the Delta YouTube channel. We have the Databricks YouTube channel. Um, and we have our website. And these are great places to go to start learning more about Delta. So our Getting Started page has you, has you start writing your first data frame, start writing out your first Delta tables, and starting to learn about the amazing benefits of Delta, like data scaping with, with stats, schema enforcement, schema evolution, awesome features like that. We have a blog, and we have like a, a few articles published every month, and these blogs are awesome. They go into like really good technical deep dives about like what is vacuum, or what is optimized, what is liquid clustering, and how do these work, and it, it like, um, it's great to explain the intricate details about like why those, these things are great, why they save you so much performance costs, uh, but also how to use them as like high level users. Our community page has even more links to like our Slack and things like that. I'll be including some of those links at the end. And if you really wanna start like contributing to Delta, perhaps like a low level at like the protocol level, go and read our protocol document. It explains like what is the Delta protocol? What are all these amazing table features? We have so many features and that's a great place to get started. So let's talk about writing code. Delta is not just on Spark. There's many, many repositories and many connector integrations that you can get started to contribute to Delta. I will talk about Delta Spark uh, because this is our, our biggest connector. So come check out our repository. There's tons of feature requests. We need help. Uh, we absolutely need more people uh, helping write code, helping merge and review PRs. So please go check out some of those. We have lots of good first issues, lots of good medium issues, a little bit more meatier tasks to help get you started. Another great area in community is Delta Rust. And I love that Delta Rust is fully community driven. Like Databricks wasn't even there at the inception of Delta Rust. People just had a problem, wanted a sparkless solution. Don't worry about clusters, just single JVM. And they started writing Delta and Rust. And that's super exciting. And what's great about Delta Rust is, you know, it's not quite um, as old as Delta Spark. And there's lots of work to do, and that's great for people that want to come and write code. So there's actually lots of write protocol features that still need to be implemented in Rust. Um, and that's just a great repository. I encourage you to check it out. And lastly, there's Delta Kernel. And Delta Kernel is so exciting. Again, more talks will talk about why this is so important. But just to like quickly summarize, the Delta protocol is hard. We have, a, we have an ecosystem of so many connectors, and they're all trying to understand the protocol and read this doc and write their code. Well, what if you could just plug into a library? And the library says, hey, give me a JSON reader. 
give me a parquet reader or writer, and don't worry about the Delta protocol details. You want the latest protocol details, just bump this version on this library, and all of a sudden your connector gets it for free. So Delta kernel is the future of integrating Delta deep into connectors, and we definitely encourage you to like help us out there. We're still implementing write support. We just uh, added a blind append support in the last release, and we're still designing like DML operations. So we need a lot of help in kernel. So those are like very uh, repository and code specific places where you can start contributing to Delta. But Delta is a fully open protocol and people are free and everyone's free to propose new ideas to improve the protocol and add new protocol features. So in the past year, we've rolled out a very formal request for comments process for how you can actually change the Delta protocol. So you propose a new spec, you kind of work with us or work with the community to implement a production version. And I do want to highlight that just to show you like what our mindset, mindset is, you know, all Delta protocol features need to keep Delta kernel in mind. There's no point in implementing a protocol feature that only works on Spark or only works on Flink. Integrate it in kernel, we have Java and Rust bindings. And then every other connector that uses kernel gets that protocol that you just designed for free. Uh, so that's just a really important thing to keep in mind. And then just to give you like some context of like the current proposals that we're working on right now, there's there's honestly tons. I couldn't be more excited about the number we have and about like their quality. So there's managed commits, um, which is similar to the uh, the S3 coordinated commits I talked about earlier but it actually enforces that all writers are going through the same commit like coordinator, which is like a really, really important problem. Uh, there's type widening, there's variant type, which is talked about uh, today for like the, the um, its benefits over uh, existing JSON parsing today, and commit timestamps and more. So, you know, go check them out, think of your own, it's completely open, we definitely encourage it. And, and you know, uh, lastly, Please integrate Delta into your engines. You know, Google BigQuery and DuckDB only like in the past few months integrated Delta. Like it's not too late. There's tons of connectors that don't have Delta and we wanna bring Delta to them. And as I've mentioned, and I'm really trying to harken this point, what's great is you have the Delta kernel Java and the Delta kernel Rust libraries to help you with this. And what's great about the Rust library is we have a C foreign function interface binding that lets you adapt Delta kernel into Go, into C++, into Python, into these other languages and these other connectors. So the Delta um, connector ecosystem is not done growing. Uh, we definitely want help uh, uh, bringing Delta to there. And that's what I wanted to cover today. I wanted to go over some great community contributions, uh, people bringing awesome features to Delta and we worked with them to ship them to production. And that's super awesome. We have a lot of different communities to work with. We have Scala, we have Rust, we have Python, all these great places. And you know, just please check out our Slack, check out our LinkedIn, our YouTube, um, ask questions in the Slack channel, ask questions on GitHub. Uh, we definitely need help. Uh, so thanks for all for listening. And if people do have questions, I do think if you could raise your hand if you do, um, we do have like a microphone so people can hear. And I'll be like lingering around the stage after this presentation as well if you wanna to talk to me in person. Uh, so thanks, everyone. Appreciate that.